Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Board of Directors meeting of the Contra Costa County Transportation Authority. If you would all rise and join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is public comments. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board on items that falls within the purview of this board but is not on tonight's agenda. At the time we reach an item on the agenda that you would like to speak to, please turn in a speaker card and we will hear from you at that time. So this is not agendized items at this time. Okay, Mr. Olson. Good evening, Chair Glover and uh, agency board members. My name is Bruce Olson. I live in Pittsburgh. I rode my bicycle to this meeting tonight. All right. Unfortunately, the safest way to ride a bicycle from East County to Central County includes riding a one-mile stretch of Highway 4 the freeway, eight-lane freeway. I'd like to enumerate, if you'll allow me, some projects that have potential for taking the bicyclist off the freeway. I know several of the board members and many bicyclists have told me that they're not comfortable having bicyclists on the freeway. I have to agree. It's not a good thing. So the first and most obvious project is remove the World War II era viaduct on Willow Pass Road. That would be good enough. However, the city of Concord, as part of its base redevelopment project, plans to make Willow Pass Road into four lanes with a landscaped median, with wide shoulders, and with a cycle track on one side or the other. Yes, however, the developer and the city haven't even sued each other yet about how this is going to happen, so I'm not holding my breath on that project. The next opportunity is a frontage road on the north side of the freeway. Arnold Industrial Way ends at Port Chicago Highway. Evora Road ends at Willow Pass Road right there by the Chevron Station, and we could connect those two. Now, as a little aside, when the Army wanted to take over the Naval Weapons Station in uh, the mid-1980s, they talked with the county, who would have been the lead agency, about this connection. But the owner of the golf course right there, the, uh, what is it, Mount Diab Diablo Creek Golf Course, said, not a chance. So the county dropped it. I was at one of the uh, base reuse public meetings about a year ago, and a City of Concord staff member said, a little bit too gleefully, I thought, yeah, those golfers are going to have to learn how to play 15 holes when we build this road. Another opportunity, the third possibility, is the Delta De Anza Trail. Right now, it ends at also the Chevron Station, and the East Bay Regional Park District plans to build it through to the trail that runs from Clyde to the Concord Senior Center Park. I think that's Boatwright Park. It runs along Port Chicago Highway and then flips onto the uh, parallel side of the park. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Okay. okay. I'll finish this next month. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next item on our uh, agenda today is the consent calendar. This includes mi the minutes of the last meeting and a number of other items. Is there anyone from the commission that would like an item removed? I have no cards of anyone from the public. Is there a member from the public that would like to have an item removed? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion? Second. Is that for the minutes or for the consent for calendar? The, they're, they're two separate items. 
So if the motion is to approve the minutes, we should do that first? Yes. Okay. So we have a motion for enrollment separate from um, Commissioner Loyola? Sure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Passes. Uh, now can I have a motion for the consent calendar? So moved. Motion by Taylor, second by... <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, passes. Moving right along, right along here. I'm under our regular agenda item. First item in the, on the agenda day is um, a discussion of the financing plan for the authorities series 2012A. Chair, we have a major oh. discussion item first. Sorry. We will go to item uh, 3.1. 3. 1, 3. 1. Um, and that is to provide an overview of the CASA initiative, Martin Engelman and Vanna uh, So will, the Bay Area Metro will present this item. Um, unfortunately, Key, Ken Kinsley was not able to make it here today and so we will have it presented by Mark. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, delighted to be here tonight to present to you um, uh, an update on what's going on at Bay Area Metro regarding CASA, the Committee to House the Bay Area. And um, very pleased to have Vikrant Sood back here again. He was at the Planning Committee meeting, and a lot of questions uh, were asked um, about this. Uh, so we'd like to uh, bring it to you, to the full, full Commission for discussion and uh, further questions. Um, so at this point, I will introduce Vikrant Sood, he's principal planner at MTCA Bag, and um, we're going to work together on this presentation. So, Vikrant. Great. Uh, thank you very much, and good evening, and thank you for having me back. As Martin said, I was here for the planning committee meeting, and uh, some of you were here, so this is a repeat of that in some ways. But um, so, just jumping into the presentation itself, uh, if you remember, as part of Plan Bay Area. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around housing affordability and displacement, and one of the indicators that we did look at was housing and transportation costs. Um, based on the information that we had at the point, uh, we, know, we knew that about 54% of uh, low-income households' income is spent on housing and transportation, and that was a pretty significant amount for the Bay Area. Uh, despite all the policies that were uh, included in Plan Bay Area, uh, we still projected that the that share of uh, household income will increase to 67%, uh, which led us to believe that there uh, needs to be more aggressive policies that we need to collectively work on, agree to, and implement across the Bay Area if you're, uh, to address that kind of an escalation in the housing and transportation costs. And if you remember, that was one of the different indicators, many indicators that we looked at in terms of housing affordability. Uh, part of the reason why we do have that crisis escalating is that we are, as a region, doing a great job of adding jobs, but not really uh, a, a good enough job of adding the housing stock to go along with it. Uh, just as an example, between 2010 and 2015, and this is a little bit of outdated data, just between that five-year period, we added more than 600,000 jobs across the Bay Area, uh, but only about 56,000 uh, housing units were permitted. So that um, gives you a sense of if we had a housing crisis in 2010 and it was escalating towards 2015, then it was, it's, it's definitely getting worse uh, day by day because of this shortage. Um, at this point, maybe I'll turn it over to uh, Martin to talk about So thank you, Vic uh, So what this slide shows is uh, basically number of homes built per year from 2000 through 2015. This is actual data by county. Um, 
if you don't remember the Great Recession, here it is in full form. An incredible dip in new housing starts, really dramatic. And uh, we may think we've recovered, but we haven't. And it, it's the, the, the Great Recession has kind of compounded the issue in that a lot of construction workers just gave up and shipped out and aren't coming back um, to build houses. So there's actually now a shortage of skilled labor. And um, not to mention the supply chain, which dried up. And uh, you may have seen a lot of businesses along Arnold Industrial Way out there in East County, Central and East County, just shriveled on the vine and are gone and have not come back. So, so this is what we're starting with. And uh, we're, we're trying to get back to a annual production uh, that will meet that $800,000 goal. And so what this next slide shows you, it goes back a little further in history than that previous slide. There was a time in the Bay Area when we were generating, on average, 45,000 units a year between 1970 and 1980. You can see that number has slowly gone down. The Great Recession years, it was down to 20 and 2010 to 2015, average home building for the Bay Region down to 10,000 a year, one-fourth of what it was in the heyday. During that time, population has continued to increase, and that's that orange line there. We're now at 7.2 million in the Bay Area. The projection is to go to 9.6 million. So if we go into the future, ABAGs and MTC's current forecast is shown in the yellow. And what they've done is they haven't front-loaded the housing because we really can't front-load housing. We've got to build up slowly. They're back-loading the housing. So what this shows is they're, they're expecting an increase in average annual production from 2020 to 2025 going up to 30, and then 30 to 35, getting pretty close to 40,000 units per year average in 2035 to 2040. So this shows you where we want to go. This is the ABAC forecast. This is being reworked now, and we're going out to 2050. So chances are there will be more than 800,000 homes that we would want to build between now and 2050. And those numbers will be coming out probably about a year from now, I think, as ABAC starts to revamp their forecast. Martin, can I, since you're on, can I ask a question or you want us to wait or? Your pleasure. Through the chat. Yeah. Uh, I guess you're going you're to have to clear it up for me. But dollars, MTC, transportation dollars can't build houses. Correct? That's right. So MTC would not have funds to build houses, correct? So. That's correct. So who's going to build the houses? We don't have funds. Local jurisdictions and the developers are going to uh, partner on that. Okay. <coughs> All right. Just through the chair, when we talk about units, I mean, you, you, you flip between units and homes. I think there needs to be in, in, in this report a very distinct, a very precise definition of what a unit is and what counts as a unit. Is it a single family home? Is it apartments? Is it multifamily? And I think that that really needs to be driven through in this whole process and they need to be clearly defined somewhere through this process that we're not necessarily talking to building 800,000 single family homes across the Bay Area because there may not be land for that. We're looking at stacking and packing and just getting how many can we get in there. Uh, and I think that needs to be really clear as we move forward on this process. And when we, we talk of a unit, it's not necessarily a single-family detached home, but could be any number. It could be a granny unit in a backyard. It could be third or second edition units in some of the other places. So I think it really needs to be defined clearly as we go forward in this process. Great. And I, I um, think that all the comments are good. I'm going to ask that we would hold them to the end so we could get through the presentation. But I just want to make a point that, you know, when SB 375 was put into effect, it, it came, but it did not come with dollars. So 
you know, we lacked transportation dollars at that time. We still lack transportation dollars, but we have a mandate with no money to go with it, so. Right, and just to underline that point, again, um, you know, in the same time, um, not only is there no revenue for um, building more housing, there isn't a lot of revenue to provide the housing and the schools and the infrastructure that goes along with it. And at the same time, we don't have redevelopment. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges that have been piled on um, over the last few years uh, on the local jurisdictions. And I was, um, uh, you know, not, not necessarily being just uh, facetious when I said, uh, you know, it's the developers who build the housing and the local jurisdictions who help plan it because at the regional level, MTC and ABAC don't have the tools. We don't build the housing. And that's one of the reasons why we have turned around and set up this uh, Blue Ribbon Committee and are also at the same time coming out to talk to local jurisdictions and all the other stakeholders to figure out a way where all the stakeholders who can make a difference uh, can come to agreement on uh, how we are going to address this housing crisis because we do have a housing crisis which I think everyone can agree to. Um, and again, to uh, again underscore the, the point that there is a lot of development that is happening in the Bay Area, but it's mostly commercial development and we are adding uh, jobs at a pretty significant rate, but not housing. Uh, and that seems to be an unsustainable trend. Um, and we hear about this not just from uh, our local jurisdictions and the residents who are feeling the pressure, uh, but also our employers. Uh, so, for example, this chart shows that it's not just one county or a couple of counties that are struggling to provide housing. It's really a region-wide problem. And if there needs to be a solution, maybe there is a regional solution to that where we partner with our local jurisdictions and partners, other partners and stakeholders to try and find solutions that, again, we are, as, as regional agencies, not proposing. We're looking for those uh, solutions to arise out of this process. Um, not only have we not built enough housing, I think uh, the housing that we did build is not really affordable, uh, and I won't go into this chart too much, but just to say that in the last cycle of RENA, the, uh, the blue bars are the uh, allocations that were made by uh, income categories, and the red bars are the uh, actual units that were permitted. And, uh, you know, again, it highlights this idea of the missing middle, but also the fact that we are significantly short on the more affordable um, side of the, of the housing stock. Um, again, that is uh, creating a lot of, um, um, you know, regional, regional and sub-regional trends that we're trying to monitor and assess. Again, we don't necessarily have all the tools and resources to address them, but if you look at the displacement risk around the region, there was a study done, done by UC Berkeley, um, which I've shown here on, uh, on this slide. Uh, it focuses in a little bit on Contra Costa County, and just as a, a broad overview of what the slide is showing, in the purple are the areas where there is displacement happening. These are low-income census tracts that are either undergoing displacement or there is significant gentrification happening at this time. But that is not to say that that is only confined to these um, communities along the Bay. It is happening even in Concord, in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, and other parts of the region. Uh, be it a suburban location, be it a small city, a large city, this is a trend we are seeing across the region, almost in every community. Uh, and the red uh, areas are higher income uh, census tracts that are also losing low income populations. So this is something that's happening across different communities. Uh, what we do think um, it will take is more than uh, a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. We have to come up with a lot of strategies. We have to work with every stakeholder, and we need to build consensus. But what we do uh, do want to emphasize through this CASA process is that we need strategies for production of both the market rate units as well as uh, affordable units. We need to preserve the existing stock of housing that we already have, uh, be it the uh, deed restricted affordable units that were built uh, with public subsidies, but those are at risk of being converted to market rate units or existing affordable units that are um, in our uh, various local jurisdictions, including in eastern Contra Costa County, in Solano, and many other places that might be, um, that might become unaffordable over time if uh, the, cu the current pressures on 
on rents and uh, prices continue to escalate. Uh, and finally, we, we do need to protect our vulnerable populations, the veterans, the, uh, the seniors, uh, low-income populations that are, again, facing a lot of the disproportionate impact from this crisis. Uh, in terms of uh, the types of strategies, it was on the last slide, but we are hoping that there is a package of strategies including that includes legislation, uh, both at the, um, well, hopefully at the state level that will enable local jurisdictions to kind of follow through uh, to some of the commitments that have already been made, uh, but also to provide tools and resources, including a, a new version of redevelopment uh, and resources like you've uh, already mentioned uh, to again help the developers, the communities, and the local jurisdictions deliver on the housing that we do need. And finally, there are, again, there's a role maybe that the regional agencies can play if everybody uh, agrees to it in providing the technical assistance, policy tools, and so on and so forth. Um, that would be additive. Um, in terms, this slide shows the structure. Uh, again, what MTC and ABAG did uh, and what the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the commission itself did, was create CASA, which is really a steering committee and a technical committee with representation from various stakeholders, including labor, uh, transit agencies, local jurisdictions, um, business organizations, employers, developers, both market rate and affordable, um, environmental groups, and community-based organizations. Um, and they are charged with coming up with the solutions. Uh, again, I should emphasize this is not an MTC and ABAG project. What we have done is convened a group of folks to help us uh, identify these solutions. We want, to, um, we, we want broad support for these um, <coughs> strategies that we do start to identify. Um, and the staff at MTC and ABAG is helping to support this effort but it isn't necessarily something that the MTC Commission or the ABAC Board are going to be proposing. It's going to come out of this process, which is being led by the three co-chairs and the various stakeholders that form part of the technical committee and the steering committee. Um, and, you know, the, the type of things on this slide to the right are the type of things that have been discussed um, already. This is not the, the full list of ideas that have come up with, uh, the technical committee has come up with so far. Uh, but uh, just as examples, there is just cause eviction and uh, short-term rental assistance from the protection side, tenant protection side. Um, so far, I think the committee, the technical committee, isn't proposing rent control as, uh, you know, the, the main solution. It's more about making sure that there is just cause uh, eviction policies put in place, that there is short-term rental uh, assistance, there is assistance to landlords, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of preservation, again, creating a preservation fund, making sure that we at least know which units are at risk of uh, converting to market rate. Uh, and then there is a whole list of things under production of affordable housing as well as market rate. Um, I'll just draw your attention to the left-hand side of the slide, which um, sets some of the targets. Uh, these are all, again, aspirational targets uh, that the CASA committee have uh, endorsed. Uh, these are not set in stone again, but it, it's kind of a guide to tell us what is the scale of impact that we are looking at. This is not about um, working at the edges, making things slightly better. It's really about finding a sustainable solution that works for the Bay Area over the long term. Um, and as I said, we are uh, reaching out to our local jurisdictions um, since um, we represent the local jurisdictions at the regional level uh, to get input. And uh, you may have received, or at least we had sent um, a survey out, an anonymous survey out to every elected official in the, in the nine county Bay area and to major, uh, to key staff uh, in the housing departments and the planning departments. And there's a link at the bottom and uh, I can provide more information about the survey. But again, it, it, it tries to get to these three questions um, it, it's trying to gather information from your perspective, what the big challenges and the barriers are, and what the solutions might be, again, from your perspective, uh, and then uh, some sense of what uh, CASA, as a, as a regional effort, could do to help local jurisdictions meet your own local needs. So with that, I'm going to uh, pause and see if there are any questions, and maybe even see if Martin, you wanted to add anything. Old, what's his name? Yeah. I, one of the things when we go through this report, and we have seen this report many, many times, is 
how it seems to be an overview of a problem, then the simplification of an answer comes out, and 10 years from now, we can do it all over again. Classic example, that chart shows from 2000 on. I was in real estate in 78. I guarantee you there are a lot more recessions than that. And what went on from like 95 to 97 made that little dip look like nothing because Santa Clara County and a few others around it decided to add about 257,000 jobs and 6,700 homes. And you know, you're always going to have that problem. The difference is we always had Alameda. We just run 580 out there. People ran out to Tracy, bought for three or four years, and then came back. It was you know, over and over and over again. When I look at and start to hear the solution that you're leading towards, let me tell you what I see as the problem. At ABAG or the legislative committee, we had a nice map that showed where the problems are in size of the problem identified by balloons and the year that these places are supposed to hit their target. I think Oakland's going to make their target, what, 2365? Is it that hard to figure out where those three cities are that were the real biggest balloons? Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose. So if you are not targeting those three, and I don't mean giving them more money, but targeting those three because they're the biggest part of the problem. Everybody wants commercial. It pays for itself. High-density housing does it. And the idea that because San Francisco decides we're going to make a lot of money building 40, 50, 60-story buildings, but we're not going to build enough housing for it, which goes back to 1960 when I was looking at those numbers, if not before, well, there are more people then than there are now. Then we're going to dump it on Amy or Dave or Julie. It makes no sense at all that they'd have to do any housing when they're ridiculously over-rich in housing, under-rich in jobs, and they're not going to get any of the jobs. So to me, unless you can come up with a solution that is going to take people off the bridges, good luck going down San Mateo to make up for this mistake that is going on north of them, then you're really just doing the same dance we've been doing in while I've been on this earth, and that is let's funnel all of our money into one pot and figure it out, and it always ends up in the same place. And what really compounds it, as far as I'm concerned, more than anything else, is a, how to be polite about this, a representative from one of those three cities that I just mentioned coming up with the most ridiculous Senate bill that I can imagine that says we're going to have to plan to make up for the shortages. As I've said way too many times, that means I'm going to have to plan to rezone a golf course, which means you'll have somebody else in his seat probably within the hour that I vote yes to do it, which I won't. I mean, the problems are much deeper than just saying, well, 13 to 1, 14 to 1. This has been going on forever. It's how are you going to put the housing close to the jobs, which is what all these environmentalist community have been pitching to us for decades. And if you're not going to do that, it's just going to be the same thing where you're shuffling money around, then I can tell you which county's going to lose and which county's going to win. Thank you. Was there a question in there? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Com Commissioner Pierce? I probably don't have a question either. Um, but um, just for clarification, no, MTC cannot build housing with their money. However... We do put money into a TOA trust fund that is leveraged, what are we now, four, five, ten to one, something like that, that can build housing. The other thing that we can do with MTC money is the OBAG grants, which build the transportation aspect or mm -hmm. contribute to the transportation aspect of TOD. Um, and so... In that way, MTC is able to assist in getting housing built by alleviating some of the cost of the transportation access to that um, housing if it's built around transit centers. Um, Amy and I were just up, and the reason we were late, sorry, uh, is we were just up in Sacramento this afternoon at the ABAG MTC Legislative Forum, um, and 
had a chance to talk with some of our legislators up there, and one of the things that David Chu brought up that, that we both thought was rather maybe just optimistic but at least somewhat hopeful is that he feels strongly that the next governor is probably going to be inclined to entertain some version of reinstatement of RDA, of redevelopment funding. It'll probably be done in a slightly different manner, and there may be better protections involved and all that, but he said it's not going to be an automatic veto um, coming from who we all expect to be the next governor. So that's a good thing. Um, as far as what Vikrant was talking about in, in answer to the question about where is the money going to come from to actually build the housing, not only could it be some version of redevelopment, but it probably will also be something that's already happening to some extent, and that's the major employers who are all engaged in this discussion that we're having at CASA. And we have CEOs of these companies um, the Yahoo's, the Facebooks, the Googles, the the Genentech's, those folks are sitting at the table at CASA. And some of them, Facebook, Google, a few others have already ponied up money to build housing. Is it enough? Nowhere close. But at least it's starting to get the idea into their head that they have to be part of the solution for their own employees. They are also, Facebook and Google, helping to pony up money for some of the transportation improvements, particularly in San Mateo County, that are necessary on 101 that we don't have any other funding for. So they're starting to come to the table, starting to understand that they are part of the problem and need to be part of the solution. Um, we, we need to continue to thank them and encourage them to do more um, but that's at least starting. And the other thing I want to say is that, you know, we in the greater East Bay area of the Bay need to be more concerted about trying to encourage the major employers to move some of their jobs, not just the think tanks, but the actual manufacturing parts of their jobs and some of the other parts of their jobs to the greater East Bay where we already have the housing that is somewhat affordable. That's not to say we don't have to do more to build more affordable housing here too, but if we're looking at the congestion aspect of the Bay Area, Certainly, giving our employers, our major employers, a broader view of what would be an improvement to the um, personal lives of their employees would be to help move the jobs out here. And there are some of us on MTC and ABAG who have taken up this mantle, and we are going to be beating this drum very loudly. And we're going to be locking arms in the greater East and North Bay to make sure that we start getting our share of the jobs instead of just being the place that provides all the homes for everybody and deals with all the congestion and pays all the tolls. So there are some of us who feel very strongly that there needs to be some equity in that as well because we've been the workhorse for housing for a long, long time. And now it's time for some of those jobs that are overcrowding other areas of the Bay to come out to where the people live. So I just wanted to give you some of those perspectives that some of us at ABAG and MTC have been working on, um, sometimes online, sometimes offline, but certainly in all of our discussions we are raising these as policy issues that need to be addressed by the greater Bay Area to recognize that the greater East Bay is a huge force in the Bay Area. In particular around the northern waterfront. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, any other comments? Okay. Yes. Yeah, just to follow up on a comment I made in, in, in the planning meeting, with housing also comes lots of services that cities need to provide, cities and school districts need to provide. And there isn't any money for that right now. Being in one of those cities that exists to the far to the far east out there, 
Uh, all of our great schools are bursting at the seams. Um, building a new high school, you need 50 acres to start with. I don't know where you're going to find 50 acres to build a new high school really? with. Uh, and the cost is anywhere between $400 million and $500 million to build a brand new high school in today's environment. Uh, that's half a billion dollars to build a high school, which is incredible. Um, you know, even if we took all the surplus uh, at the state at 19, at what, $19 billion, there's 22 high schools across the state that need to be built, and that surplus is gone. So, I mean, there, there is just so much money in need out there, and um, I don't know where it's coming from. I don't think anybody does, because there's no way that I can go to Citizens of Oakley and try to bond for a brand new high school of half a billion dollars. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we have parts of the city that are already paying almost 2% with the uh, property taxes with the fees they have on just getting the infrastructure out there. And with transportation-wise, following up with both Dave and Julie, we need the job. The jobs are paramount out there. We, we have to continue like this. Not to beat, a, not to beat a, a drum even louder, but why not? Uh, with the jobs need to come out there. I mean, you, we, you, 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 on your map, you had the gentrification of of Pittsburgh and, and Oakley and Brentwood, the gentrification is because everyone's fleeing the core Bay Area, coming out to to this uh, island of affordability in the Bay Area called East County, and buying homes out there. And that's why they're that's why we're pushing everything out there because it's the only place in the Bay Area where you can buy a house for not Brentwood anymore, but Oakley and Oakley and Antioch and Pittsburgh probably for around five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand dollars. I mean, I mean that's. Okay. A, a, a reality right there, and so there's a lot more. The, the, uh, I, I, you know, uh, building single-family homes doesn't require a lot of input from us, but where's the money going to come from to build the affordable part? How much? How much is a subsidy per, <coughs> per unit? That's what I want to remember. Some obscene amount of money per unit for for what? Five hundred grand per unit. Yeah, if I per could, unit. sure. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's you know, we, um, where you come up, redevelopment isn't going to isn't going to starting from scratch again, isn't going to get the money you need to for affordable and semi affordable housing. Yeah, Mr. And, um, Mr. Chairman, I have okay. a response to one of the questions. Okay, and I, are you finished with your report update? Okay, so go for it. So, so we we've been going through a learning curve on this, and and. Uh, uh, as the congestion management agency representative on the regional planning committee, we, we had an entire session about um, what it costs to build an affordable unit. What is the subsidy? And, and 10 years prior, we had brought the county in here, and we had county redevelopment telling us what that number was. When the county was in here, they told us that number was about $350,000 per unit needed to make an affordable unit pencil out for a developer. And then at the Regional Planning Committee, that number went up to $550,000 per unit. Now that's an average for the Bay Region, so it sounds a little high. It's probably different county, county by county, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of money we're talking about. It's, it's a half a million dollars a unit subsidy needed to produce one. Uh, well, I think that's actually low income. Yes, um, Commissioner Worth and oh, then uh, Trotter. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to thank you for the presentation. Appreciate your uh, staff coming out to all the CMAs to give the CASA, the CASA presentation. Um, I, I don't want to repeat what was said. I concur with all the comments, um, but I did want to add a couple things. First of all, I think it's you know, it's this idea of moving jobs as opposed to increasing housing in job centers is, is really critical. Because our, the, if, you, if you, you know, the voter polls show that they, they, they see two problems. One is housing, but the second is congestion. And the concern I have is if we can't start to locate substantive jobs out in Contra Costa County, we are forcing our residents again back on the freeways, back on the trains for these longer and longer commutes which aren't sustainable. The, the, the other thing, and, the, and I think Mayor Taylor asked the question about how do you fund housing? Can we use transportation dollars? You know, this is, a, this is something I think that we in Contra Costa County need to be concerned about moving forward in the future. Um, at the commission, there have been several attempts over the last few years to either uh, uh, tie 
uh, transportation funding to housing production um, or to take more and more of the transportation dollars into housing production and I think it's something that our you know we've been watching very carefully I think it's going to come back to us in the coming year and this board will take a need to take a really important have a voice in that because it, frankly it's our residents that are really going to be impacted by this if this m moves forward because there just isn't enough transportation money to do the kinds of congestion and capacity investments like the 680 I'm just going to use 680 as an example that corridor so I, I think that's the other issue that w we need to be watching in these planning efforts to ensure that we're able to um, ensure that the transportation dollars are spent on these transportation investments Commissioner Trotter thank you uh, mr. chairman um, as a representative of Moraga uh, first of all I would I, for a bunch of reasons, I would not be thrilled with Amy's suggestion that somehow tra getting transportation dollars for a, a cul-de-sac community like Moraga would be based upon our, our production of housing. Uh, I guess that's one. I do, I do, however, agree with what David said and everybody said about um, the fact that we do need to redress the job housing balance so that there are more jobs out here in Contra Costa. They don't have to be in Moraga, but it would be nice if they were a little bit more closely located uh, to a place like uh, Moraga. Um, and then, of course, you, you had the graphic up there, and I forget the language for that red, those red jurisdictions. It was like extreme exclusion, or what was the wording that you had on that, sir? No, no, we're all advanced exclusion. And uh, go back to the questions. Go back to the question slide. Um, and the reason why I said what I said about, about Amy's suggestion is that, in fact, Moraga, you know, has planned for higher density housing. Um, we have a, center, a Moraga Center-specific plan area. It's got 90 acres, mostly undeveloped, right around one of our shopping centers. And we have a developer, we have a property owner that can't develop. And there actually are places that have been indicated on that, um, that plan for densities in excess of 20 units per acre, which per se qualify as affordable without regard to what the housing actually costs. Um, so the fact is we have done our planning. I don't think CASA can do anything for Moraga. I'll be candid because we have a problem with a property owner that doesn't think rationally. So um, bottom line is that, uh, you know, we, that's our challenge. Challenge in our jurisdiction is, a, is, a, is, is there is one property owner that controls all the all the uh, empty land around our shopping center and is not doing anything to try to put it in the hands of people that want to actually gentrify that area. So um, I don't think CAP, CASA, I don't, what does what is, what is the acronym acronym stand for? Nothing. Um, it, 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 there was an acronym, but it was dropped, so now it's just uh, the Committee to House the Bay Area. It's Spanish for House. That's right. Yes. Very clever. Um, in Moraga, you know, that's not a problem. We have, we've done our planning, and we just don't have a partner to get some of those things done to try to revitalize our downtown. If I can, I just Thank clarify: you. the the discussion has been not planning, but production. Yeah, exactly. And, That's and exactly I think, my point. And I think all of our cities have done extensive planning. You know, we've been up in Sacramento working on this part, some of these housing bills, and and to every single city has been doing the planning and because of the market forces we are struggling with the actual production yeah okay we we have a lengthy agenda tonight so I will take the last two comment lights that I've seen on Commissioner Pierce well I guess three now uh, Hudson and but I will be really like quick um, one of the other discussions that started a couple of years ago at ABAG was that there should be other ways of making existing housing more affordable to working families. And some of the strategies that could be used are things like work proximity housing loans, where you would give somebody, for example, a $50,000 down payment uh, loan for a $500,000 house, and when they refinance or sell, that money comes back at the same percentage of what they got 
So if they sell it for six hundred thousand, sixty thousand comes back into the trust fund, and it's self-perpetuating that way. That's another way of looking at affordable housing. But it doesn't count as a unit according to HCD yet. So that's one of the other heavy lifts that we've got to do, is try to make existing housing more affordable, and do it for a whole lot less money. So we have to look at that kind of strategy as well as many others to make this whole equation work. Okay, I'll take it up. Yeah, I, I, I listen to this and we're doing exactly the same thing we've done before. You have to identify where the problems are. Three counties I can name went ahead, took the easy route, commercial, commercial, commercial. Commercial will pay for itself, high density doesn't. Oh, it's too much. We got to get subsidy. They didn't do their job. Contra Costa has a pretty darn good jobs housing balance. As we go forward, and we've talked about adding jobs out here, we have to make sure we don't make the mistakes the others did and not be part of the funding source of these other counties that didn't do their job. And that message needs to get sent back there. Guys, you want to keep doing this for short term gain? We're not going to bail you out. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Butt. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the maps like we've seen, you know, been around for a while, and you see them all the time, and, you know, they aggregate data and draw broad conclusions, and it's useful. But I, I think you have to look at all this city by city. Um, for instance, in my city, we, uh, in 2012, which is now, what, six years ago, we upzoned um, all the major thoroughfares in the city to a point that we could accommodate 30,000 new units, right? And um, for year, you know, for years, there, was, there, there hadn't been anything built in Richmond in 15 years. And so... Um, and so we built, you know, we've got the infrastructure and the zoning to handle it, but, peop but developers won't build there because the rents are so cheap they can't make any money off of it. And they can't sell the units for enough money to make, to make money off of it. And that's a whole other thing I'm not going to get into. But, for example, if, if you could use some kind of incentives to get builders to come to Richmond, then... Um, a, you know, a lot of units could get built there. Transportation is one way of doing it. I think, you know, uh, we're, we're, I hope, not overly optimistic by bringing the ferry in um, this fall that, um, that it, it might give developers an incentive to be a little more um, <clears throat> proactive about looking at Richmond as a location for new housing. When we get when we get a new train control system on BART and we can run more BART trains, you know, Richmond really has three stations, two of which it shares with El Cerrito. Uh, so if you get if you get better BART service, you know, then then you you build up those incentives. But that's our problem. We can't get we we've got exactly the opposite problem that Moran has and some of you guys have. Um, we're, we're not fighting to keep developers out. We're fighting to get them in, and they won't come. A lot of us are. So, a lot of us are. Mr. Can okay. I can I just follow okay. up? With, okay. Um, or or if, not, if, if I'm out of order, really brief. Real, real brief. I just want to agree with uh, with Tom. I, I think I, I represent an area um, where developers have expressed interest in in building uh, um, units. Uh, but the rents won't support Class A construction, so they're just not going to make the investment, and I presume the communities won't support anything lower than Class A. So we're stuck in this, we're stuck in this, uh, you know, area where, where it, nothing goes, goes forward. I, I've said it, Bart, and I've talked to legislators, it, if you're really serious about wanting uh, quality housing in communities that are open, like Richmond and others, or open, you ought to put in place a housing bank. Uh, where if, if, a, if a, a project of, uh, of, of a couple hundred units, units costs $50 million, and I'm just making up numbers here, and the, the, the rents that, are, that can be charged in that community only support a $40 million investment, somebody ought to come in and put that $10 million into the, into the mix. Then you can, you can begin to get the, the synergy and dynamic in the, in the communities that, that are open to housing. But as long as you have that gap between 
um, affordability and low rents, th this problem is going to continue it's, it's, and it's going to continue to go on. So if, if that affordability gap, I mean, there are tax credits that people can do, and, they, and those, those are very helpful. Um, and there are other, we used to have redevelopment, but there, there are other financing um, ways of accomplishing it. But so many projects are abandoned because the, the developer has everything in place except the pro forma for the project will support the, the, uh, um, the finished product. So a, a housing bank that could be available makes a lot of sense to me, but um, at least at the moment, there's been a lot of resistance to do it, to taking that approach. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you for the report. There's no action here tonight, but there's been a very lively discussion, and I would hope that you would share um, the words of wisdom coming from this commission with CASA as you continue to work on solutions. Okay. Again, thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Victor. And when will you guys be reporting back? The, the um, we can come back as often as you like, but I think in two months we probably will have a little, little better little update. Stuff. Okay. Thank you. All right, we will now move to our regular agenda items. This is to um, the first item will be to discuss the financing plan for the Authority Series 2012 A bonds. Uh, this action will be presented by Mr. Carlson. Carl Tim. Good evening, Chair Glover, members of the Authority Board. My name is Randy Carlton. I'm the uh, Deputy Executive Director uh, for Administration here at the Authority. Um, we're here to discuss a proposed plan to refinance the Authority's 2012A bonds. Uh, Melissa Schick, uh, Chumar Wright is our financial advisor with the firm of k and Public Finance. Uh, we have six slides. Um, to summarize key points of the uh, plan, uh, the issue we face, uh, the objectives, the options that we've studied, and the proposed uh, next steps. Um, a hard copy of the slides are there uh, at your desk in front of you, um, which contains some additional information in the appendix, should you be interested. Um, I just want to say before we launch into the presentation that uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, this is a highly complex type of financing. Um, it is not your fixed rate type of bond that you may be uh, more familiar with. Um, so uh, I would ask for your indulgence to uh, allow staff and a uh, financial consultant to get through some of the content, and we'll be happy to address your, your questions. The issue, we have a debt portfolio of $705 million. It contains $504 of million of conventional fixed rate debt, and it also contains $201 million of variable rate bonds. Uh, we call those the 2012A bonds. Um, the interest rate on these bonds, they adjust on a monthly basis, and they function in a similar fashion to an adjustable rate mortgage and how that would work. Um, the inherent risk, as you would uh, imagine, uh, with an adjustable rate product is that we don't know what the rate will be next month. Um, so to help us control that risk uh, on that variable rate exposure, uh, the authority uh, entered into an agreement uh, called an interest rate swap with, with Bank of America. And this agreement, it calls for Bank of America the other party uh, to the swap agreement, to pay the authority each month an amount designed to offset the amount that we pay on those adjustable rate mortgages. So uh, adjustable rate mortgages, excuse me. I got caught up in my analogy. To pay the, uh, the, uh, the interest rate on adjustable rate bonds. Um, so in other words, as the interest rate change, which it does every month, right, and the amount of our bonds payment changes, the amount that we receive from the interest rate swap also changes and it moves as interest rates uh, increase, 
the amount that we receive from the swap increases, and that's the amount that we use to offset the payment on our bonds. Um, in return for this uh, agreement from Bank of America to pay us this amount, this variable amount, a variable amount no matter high, how high interest rates may go or how low, we agree to pay Bank of America a fixed sum based on 3.67, 3.65 percent. So in the end, and I'm, and I'm summarizing a very complex transaction, after we add up all of these inflows, all of these outflows, our total cost of borrowing on this uh, financial uh, plan that we have that includes adjustable rate bonds and the interest rate swap, it costs us about 4 percent which is a competitive rate nonetheless. What went wrong and why we're here tonight um, is that relationship that I was describing between what we receive from the swap and what we pay on the bonds has changed. All right, we are now paying more on the bonds and that change is due to uh, the Tax Reform Act that went into effect on Jan January 1 that uh, change the marginal tax rate. We heard about this, right? It was went from 35 percent to 21 percent, and and that had a, a, a dramatic impact upon uh, the type of bonds that the authority um, has issued. Our costs increased, you know, 20 percent. You could see on the slide before tax reform, our total debt service, and this includes all of our anticipated financing costs through 2034 was $298.2 million. After the adjustment to um, our, our bond loan, the, the cost went up to $306.7 million. So that's the issue we're facing and that's the issue that we're trying to, to fix. Our objectives are clear. Um, we believe that it's in the best interest of the authority that we uh, refinance those bonds, refinance those bonds as quickly as possible into a more cost-effective type of uh, borrowing solution. And while looking at that alternative to refinance those bonds, you know, we committed to the board to take a look at the interest rate swap. And uh, if there are options in that regard to do something different, we want to bring those forward, which we have. And it's part of the, uh, the, uh, the options that we'll be discussing tonight. Um, and, and, and last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Melissa is that these options and numbers that we're discussing tonight, um, these are estimates based upon the current market. These numbers will likely change before, between tonight and when we return to the board in July seeking your final authorization for these bonds. Um, so with that, um, I would like to just go into the options and turn it over to um, Melissa. Sure. Good evening, Chairman and, and Commissioners. Um, so with regard to the options on the bonds, um, the authority doesn't need to do anything immediately. Um, it's just we're here before you to mitigate the impact of increased costs. Uh, so know that there is the option to do nothing. Uh, and you could stay in the current form of the bonds through December of 2020. Um, but this, this option does increase the cost of um, the authority's debt uh, pretty substantially, uh, what we estimate approximately $307 million over the remaining term of these bonds. Um, Really to mitigate the impact of Randy was just alluding to where you're receiving a variable payment on your swap and you're making a variable payment on your bonds. Uh, and right now that's offset where your variable rate bond payment is higher. Um, and really to address that impact, first and foremost, uh, option A chooses um, an alternative variable rate on the bond such that we get the receipt and the payment more in line uh, and the authority is just merely paying a fixed rate on the swap. Um, to do this, we explored a number of variable rate alternatives for the bonds. 
Um, and it's our recommendation to issue a three-year floating rate note, which is very similar to your existing structure. The difference is that the note would be placed in the public market with public investors rather than privately placed with a bank. Um, the keeping, you know, option A would also keep the swap outstanding. It would just merely change the mode on your bonds. And it's estimated that this structure um, would achieve a debt service cost of $290 million through the term of the bonds, um, which is substantially lower than the, the do-nothing scenario. Um, as Randy alluded to, right now the current market really presents a favorable alternative to addressing your swap. Um, and as we're looking at the underlying bonds, we felt compelled to also look at the economics of uh, terminating some or all of that interest rate swap and take some of the complexity out of the authority's debt portfolio. Um, option B uh, presents an option where you, the authority would terminate a portion of the swap and issue uh, fixed rate bonds and then keep a portion of the swap outstanding and replace the underlying variable rate bonds with those three-year FRN products in the public market. Uh, the objective of option B was really try to control cost um, and con control costs really consistent with option A. So option B does not terminate the entire swap. It merely terminates uh, the swap up to approximately $100 million, such that the cost of the alternative is not overly oner onerous relative to option A. So you'll see here we estimate total debt service of approximately $292.9 um, million. And then finally, we looked at a full termination of your swap, uh, completely taking the swap out of the authority's debt portfolio, converting to an entirely fixed rate bonds. Um, while the market uh, right now is favorable to terminating the swap, uh, there is a relatively high cost to terminating the entire portion of the swap. Uh, therefore, you'll see that this alternative results in an estimated debt service cost um, that actually exceeds the current do-nothing scenario. So just briefly uh, to touch on some of the benefits and considerations of each of these options, under the do-nothing, stay the course, um, really uh, the primary distinction here is from a benefit perspective, there's nothing for the authority to do today. Um, but it certainly fails uh, in terms of our objective to reducing your cost. And there would also be an impact uh, with regard to the strategic plan and the programming of projects uh, given the increased cost. Um, f in terms of option A, uh, we, the approach and um, the rationale for the approach is merely just from a cost perspective. Um, it in increases, it lowers your, um, your borrowing costs substantially, and it also increases capacity from a programming perspective within your strategic plan projections. Um, on the flip side, it maintains all of the <coughs> risks or considerations or complexities associated with both variable rate bonds as well as uh, an interest rate swap. Um, and there's concerns that we've, we've spoken with APC in advance of speaking with you all t this evening um, with regard to some of those risks, uh, posting collateral on the swap, which the authority has done in the past, um, there's a, both the swap and the variable rate on the existing bonds are indexed to a LIBOR index, which is expected to be discontinued at the end of 2021. Um, and then there's also just the notion of ongoing reissuance for these products. So every 
three to five years, the authority would have to be in the market uh, to reset the interest rate on the underlying bonds. Uh, looking at the options that address your swap with regard to some termination, um, I guess maybe let's move to the right column on option C. Really, uh, the full reduction of the swap takes away all of these complexities out of the authority's portfolio. You issue fixed rate bonds. There's no need for ongoing remarketing or rate reset on the bonds and you really establish a known cost of borrowing at the time of doing the transaction. Um, the, the consideration here is it fails in terms of meeting our lower cost objective, and it has impact um, with regard to programming um, within your strategic plan and your strategic plan projections. Uh, option B, we found, and again, I'd like to highlight actually that this was the APC recommend, recommended option, is that it strikes a balance between option A and option, option C. It, get, it reduces both your variable rate uh, debt and your, vari your swap exposures by approximately 50%, and it takes some of that complexity and risk off the table. Um, and it, from a cost perspective, we're awfully close to um, the option A option, which is the lowest cost alternative. Uh, it also wouldn't have an adverse impact with regard to the strategic plan uh, and estimates within the strategic plan. It does, though, we don't fully terminate the swap, and we do still have variable rate bonds outstanding. So it does still contain the complexities associated uh, with your variable rate bonds and your swaps, but it's just to a lesser extent. Uh, and it takes some of those risks and concerns off the table. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's the heavy lifting part of the presentation, and we're now want to talk about our next steps, and we'll be happy to take your questions. But, uh, we want to bring forward the APC's recommendation to uh, go down the path of uh, option B and return to the board uh, in July with the authorization uh, resolution. We've already began work gathering uh, participants for the financing team, reaching out to underwriters, our bond council, uh, to prepare documents so that we can move quickly. Uh, on this. So it's with uh, staff recommendation um, that uh, the board um, have concurrence with the APC's recommendation to, to move forward with option B, and we'd be happy to take any of your questions. Hey, I, I got a couple of questions. One, there's no cap on any of these. So APC was, is um, Commissioner Arnrich on that committee? Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and where did he stand on, on this recommendation? He was the maker of the motion he, for he option was. B. Okay. Thank you. Any other commissioner's comment? Uh, Commissioner Pierce? Yes, and I apologize. I was not at the APC meeting. I had gotten in too late that morning to make the, the, the meeting, but I do have a question. Um, I fully concur with this option. I, I guess my question is, if you were to put on your, or look into your crystal ball, do you see over the next few years a likelihood that there would be an opportunity to complete the termination of the swap going forward? It's an it's a excellent question. Um, the, the, the value of the swap um, with regard to the termination value uh, is reduced as interest rates increase. Uh, I think we all feel right now with our crystal ball, although we're never right, right, that interest rates are trending upward and it's the expectation that they will continue to trend upward. That will have the effect of reducing the termination value on your swap. Option uh, B that we're looking at 
would terminate the front end of the swap and there would be the remaining you know five to six maturities left outstanding as we move through um, you know if, over the next three years there would be that opportunity to evaluate the remaining portion of the swap outstanding uh, and with interest rates trending higher that ought to be um, more economical to do so so we might actually get to a point depending on where the interest rates go to a point where it would be a zero cost basically to terminate the swap and refinance in something it, it's possible a little more stable it's possible yeah we don't know we understand that but it's looking better for that yeah. than it has and the one just the one distinction with that as rates go higher so do your cost of your fixed rate debt right so while you may not have to make a swap payment just your cost of refunding the bonds um, may be higher than that. they are today okay thank you uh, Commissioner Hudson yeah there was also something around 2026 the payment increased or I know he'd asked a question about that and I don't have it here was there something involved with that? Or do you want it? Yeah. Yeah. So the the twenty two we're talking about twenty twelve A bonds. There's also twenty twelve B bonds, and together they create uh, a structure that's level. The twenty twelve B bonds have principal pain uh, in the front years. The twenty twelve A bonds that we're speaking about. The principal payment and the swap notional begins in 2026. So that's why that payment, you have interest only through 2026, and then your payment increases in 2026 because there's both principal and interest. And then that carries out through the term of the bonds through 2034. And, but if the one of the things that I thought I heard the, from the presentation, Randy, was that our payments remain stable. Same? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. But if the cost or the interest is higher, then you have less principal in that payment? Um, we're you? really only looking at interest on the 2012 A bonds. It's, it's like an interest only loan until we reach those outer years. Um, what I was trying to explain is the relationship between the bonds and, and the swap. Um, they're separate, but yet they're connected in a way to where as interest rates rise, we receive more from the swap, but so does our bond payment. Also, It also increases. So the idea is to keep those level, but because um, some additional points as an example have been added to our loan there we have this mismatch and you know the, the the best thing that we could recommend is to to take that loan out and refinance it and and return that relationship to more of a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, Commissioner Taylor followed uh, by uh, just a comment I was trying to go ahead Trotter you might say what I'm gonna say maybe it's entirely possible <laughs> Pardon me? No. Um, maybe you can help me out. Um, on the options page, I'm, I'm looking at options A, B, and C. I, I agree, do nothing does not make sense. It's not cost effective. When I look at option A, it has the lowest estimate at this point of what it would cost to do this. And it's substantially, it's a little bit lower than option B, um, two and a half million dollars, not, not chicken feed. Mm -hmm. And so, Explain to me why it is that you would recommend a higher cost alternative, and maybe you can also explain how much give there is in these numbers, how much risk, how much this is crystal ball gazing as, a, and, and as opposed to actually knowing what those differences in cost might be in terms of refinancing. The last question I have is, uh, do these numbers that you're talking about factor in transactional costs? Do some of these... Do some of these alternatives cost more in terms of who we have to pay to get these things done in terms of consulting fees, legal, underwriting, what have you? If I could take the, the last question first. You know, all of these numbers that you see oh, on this one, slide. One thing, sorry. Was that your question, Bob? No. <laughs> in, in regards to 
transactional fees. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, on the, the, the floating rate notes, um, they are reissued every three, four, or five years. Um, and there are transactional uh, fees incurred each time. In, in these numbers that you see here um, in option A and, and option B, um, we built those transactional fee estimates into the, the total debt service number. So they're, they're already uh, included. Their estimate, how confident are you with respect to the, those estimates being roughly in the ballpark? Um, I would say within 2% okay. um, var variation, one, up and down. That's good to know. Then there's the rest of my question. Sure. Um, so the, the option A certainly is the lowest cost uh, alternative, and, and that's how it was presented and discussed at, at APC. Um, and, but with regard to the additional cost under option B, uh, it's $2.5 million, um, and it's notable. Uh, but I think out of the discussion out of APC, it was viewed to take the, the incremental additional costs to reduce over, you know, approximately $100 million of both variable rate and swap-related complexities. Um, Uh, so, so, and then in terms of the cushion or how confident, you know, we are with regard to the difference between op the cost of option A and cost, uh, option B, it changes, uh, to be very frank, it changes daily. Uh, and these numbers were based off of um, May, middle of May interest rates. We track it consistently. Um, and we would certainly, uh, I think our objective for option B is would be to reduce the swap such that it is not it was, is within the you know the ballpark of option A and does it does yeah. not overly onerous with regard to so maybe cost. maybe you can maybe just to follow up which of these options is more volatile more exposed to for example uh, the, uh, the risk of increase in interest rates in the bond market option or, yeah yes between A and B or are they roughly equally exposed? Option A is more exposed to both swap and variable rate um, volatility, and um, that's it would be approximately $200 million. Uh, option B reduces variable rate and swap uh, complexities by $100 million, yeah, and you, it has fixed rate bonds associated and, with and it. And you, you used May numbers, but you didn't try to project in these you made no projections going forward because it's impossible to, brought, to forecast. That's correct. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. But the option B does have a fixed rate component, mm -hmm. and so that would be locked in at pricing mm -hmm. um, and fixed through the term of the bonds. I get it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Taylor? No, Randy Bunnett. Oh, uh, Randy. Executive Director? Commissioners, I was just going to add this. So if you look back in history, we, uh, over the last eight years, in, I inherited this issue for whatever reason. And so we started the, down the process of doing a public placement every three years, which costs us transactional fees every three years. And then one of the proposals on the last up, update was, let's do a private placement for five years, which will save us the transactional fees instead of going every three years to deal with this $200 million synthetic derivative, we would go every five years. And we thought, what a great deal. And we saved a lot of, we saved some money on that deal because we weren't gonna have to go back to the market again. And hopefully, State Street Bank would have renewed that agreement another five years and another five years. So what happens is that when the tax yeah. rules change, that changed the whole thing, and that's what we had a wrinkle, and that's why we're here talking about these options. And what's happened today in, in this climate is that the spread has gotten enough to where that $100 million is down to about $2.5 million approximately. It's not split equally among the regions, so the East County is going to pay more of that $2.5 million dollars. I think the decision is, do you want to get rid of half of the headache now for $2.5 million and not have to talk about half of it into the future? And, and stick and, East Bay with the cost? Is that East County? No, I'm saying East County pays 49%, so it's in here. So it's not an equitable split because they're more heavy on capital, and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the tool that we use to accelerate construction. We use this tool to accelerate construction, and we've used it pretty well. 
And I would say we've saved a lot of money over time because we were able to do all five segments of State Route 4 under very low interest rate conditions. And so right. this whole process, when you look back, has done its job of delivering all these construction projects in a low interest rate environment, a low bid environment. So yeah. I just wanted to add that because that's the decision is do you want to spend, go with the status quo, or do you want to take out half of the risk now for $2.5 million? Yeah. That's really what you're talking about. And, yeah, I could fluctuate 2 dollars 25 2.6, you know, whatever, but it's right around the ballpark. And the sooner we make the decision, the sooner we can go to work and sell whatever this, the process is and, and, you know, get rid of half of it and sell the required bonds or keep it and sell more bonds, FRNs. <laughs> so the, what I'd like to suggest is, through the chair, you did acknowledge me, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, poor East County, where we'll, we'll struggle. <laughs> anyway, uh, since we're going to make the most of this, I can tell you right now, Newell vetted this out. Randy, am I correct? When he got done, you were ragged. Your, your organization knew we were what we were about. So with that being said, I would like to make a motion for option B. Second. Okay, there's a motion by Taylor, second by Pierce, shared with Hudson. All in favor of the motion, signify aye. aye. Any abstentions? Okay, it passes. Mr. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to announce I let the chair know. Unfortunately, I have to leave. I have a speaking engagement, and that is why I'm, I'm leaving the meeting, but I wanted to vote on that. So thank you very much. Okay. And I want to congratulate you and let you know that uh, we look forward to continue to work with you on two entities. Uh, that was only two weeks ago, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just seeing you. I would I would just make a comment that on this last item that because we've accelerated some of these projects we've saved far more yeah. than two and a half million dollars in financing by accelerating these projects and so you know I, I think if anybody had any questions about whether it was worth doing it's it's paid off in spades yeah. over time and and that looking forward by our staff and finding a way to accelerate projects has been what's allowed us to do as much as we've done and kudos to everybody involved yeah. thank you so much and, I and just to add on to that I, I think the thing to to look at as we accelerated those projects that most of those were in the East County region so and I just want to say I, I I missed the last meeting, I would, although I'm the chair of APC, so I missed our meeting. I was up in Alaska, so maybe I would have not asked all these questions if I hadn't had such a poor attendance record. And I want to apologize to everybody in the room for that. I think it's a good decision. Okay. So we will move on. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing item on the 2018-19 um, proposed budget for the authority and the congestion management agency. Um, this uh, item will be presented by Brian Kellyher. Um, so at this time we will um, have the public hearing uh, related to the 2018-19 proposed budget for the Contra Costa Transportation Authority Congestion Management Agency. Prior to open the hearing, staff will give a presentation of the of the proposed budget. Afterwards, the public hearing, uh, we will have an opportunity to open for comments and questions of the board. And at that time, we will also have public uh, comments. If you're interested in making a public comment, please fill out a speaker card um, to, the, to the clerk. So at this time, Brian, we will uh, have your report on the 2018-19 proposed budget. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, my name is Brian Kelleher. I'm the Finance Manager, and I'm here tonight to talk about the 2018-19 budget. Um, the first screen we have here is, is going to look very, very familiar to you as we do this with all of our budgets. We try and give you a snapshot of everything that we're doing um, in just a few lines. Um, 
So our increase in budget, as you can see, our 2018-19 proposed budget in front of you tonight jumps from $182.5 million to $243.9 million. Um, in most cities and towns, that's going to be a huge increase. But here at the Transportation Authority, the big percentage of our work is about 60% of it is all project related. Um, as our sales tax revenues increase, so do our programs, planning, and administrative functions as well, and debt service continues to be roughly about the same. Um, in the top section of this slide here, you can see that we have about a $20 million increase in local revenues. Um, the local revenues in there, a huge part of that is about $13.5 million is ECRFA fees for the Balfour project. Uh, we also have some bond proceeds that we're going to be using in there. That's about $58.5 million. Last year, we issued a 2017A bond. It generated about $100 million. <clears throat> so far this year, we've used about $42.5 million as it continues to earn interest. We will use the remaining bond proceeds next year based on the projections below that show about $135.7 million in CIP projects. Um, the next few slides, we'll go over the sales tax, we'll go over all the different revenue sources, we'll discuss how all this is allocated to the different projects and programs. As we all know, our bread and butter is the sales tax revenue. Um, as you can see, over the last five years, our sales tax revenue has increased substantially from $75, $76 million all the way up to $91 million. Um, we're projecting it between the budget of 2018 and next year 2019 budget is about 5.3%. Um, on the next slide, I'll go over our point of sales transactions. That'll show we're up about 3.3%. And then when I do my projections for the following year, I typically try and keep it around 2% just to be on the conservative side. As we look here, we're looking at the first nine months of activity in this fiscal year that we're in now is the fiscal year 17, 18 year um, as we're looking and we've received about $66.9 million and in the bottom corner there you see it's increased about 3.3%. Um, the good news in there for us is the gas tax revenues have increased about 11%. Um, we also have the strong economy. We have a lot of money that comes in from the construction and heavy equipment. As you go to the far right-hand column, you can see in there that our retail stores are very high. That's about 19% of our revenue that comes in. Um, new auto sales is 12.5%. Um, we also have a lot of income that comes in from the restaurants at 10%. So when we look at our revenue sources, after sales tax revenue, the other large portion is about $37.1 million is for capital projects. This is money that we earmark and that we've gone out and that we've received from Regional Measure 2. VADA has a little bit of money that's left in there to finish up one of our projects. We have STIP funding for the I-680 HOV lanes. We have ECRFA funds for Balfour that we already discussed. And in addition to the $37.1 million, we also get some federal surface transportation funds, some state planning programming monitoring funds, and some other federal and state funds to, for the CMA functions and the PDA functions of the planning department. We also receive $1.7 million of TFCA, which is your motor vehicle registration surcharge. And then we also entered into agreement in this fiscal year with the state for a transportation grant of $3.5 million. And we're expecting to receive about $1.4 million next fiscal year, which is what we're budgeting. So when we look at the CIP projects, with the main portion is CIP projects one through nine as the finance folks look at it. And then here we have the capital improvement projects. We start off with the Caldecott Tunnel. We're still spending about $7.9 million. Um, some of that is landscaping, some is that the final billing that we're receiving from Caltrans. Um, so it, a lot of these big CIP projects will take several years to wrap up and close up. Um, as, we, as we go down this slide, we come up to about $106 million. We have the I-680 corridor in there, which is the big HOV project we have going, the I-680 SR4 interchange project, which is about $36 million, and wrapping up the Balfour project at 226 So all of the funding in here, we try to we set up a column in here. We're going to get 
ARM2 funding, you can see which projects that's allocated to. We also have the STIP funding, you can see where that's allocated to. And then there's a remaining balance of about $69.9 million. So we use about $58.5 million of the bond funds to help fund these things. And then there's the residual of about $11.5 million that will come from Measure J funds that have been set aside through the sales tax in prior fiscal years that will be used to complete these projects for this fiscal year. So when we go back to the sales tax, we have a, the 100 percent allocation there. You can see that capital projects gets about 42.5 percent, and that's where we set the capacity on the bonding capacity that we were talking about earlier, and that's where we're allowed to bond up to. Um, so of the 91.1 million dollars in there, you can see how it's allocated out. And as we keep talking about as part of the reserve function, we'll receive 91 million dollars, but we'll spend about 232 million dollars. So in there we have the revenues and bonds, that we also that's $58 million. We also have the $37 million in other funding. And then what we call is the programs reserved is about $41 million. That's from money that we've received since the inception of Measure J that hasn't been used to build the projects that have been earmarked for your individual communities. Um, and then we also have the Measure C project, and there was also a staff report that was in the uh, consent calendar that explains wrapping up Measure C and extending it one more year, and that's going to be about $7.7 million. So as we look at the capital projects and how we can change drastically from year to year, this shows um, how we go from 75.8 million to 125 million the next year. Again, the same projects that we've kind of outlined over earlier. We have the I-680 SR4, we have the, the Balfour project, and we also have the I-680 corridor, which are the big moving projects for this year. So it's very exciting. And then here we look at the individual proposed expenditures for the other portions of the authority. We have the administration group, um, who, which part of the, through the expenditure plan, has a 1% limitation. Every year, um, we, we kind of track about the 0.8% of the 1% limitation, so we're staying below that every year, and we like to, to, to let all of you know that when we go through this. Um, some additional savings that we have in the administration um, section is pension rates. We had, we had the change from uh, everyone being classic employees. They implemented the PEPRA to help share the pension costs. Um, so for the authority, our pension contributions have decreased as a, as a portion of that. And we also have some increase this year, some office furniture and equipment through the administrative section, which is going to be about $120,000. $85,000 of that is for a combination of adjustments related to one-time expenditures. Um, and we're also going to be replacing the carpet and chairs here in the boardroom. Um, the programs department is 63.3 million this year, and it's an increase of 13.7 million. Um, once again, these expenditures, a lot of them are tied out for all the buses and all the other communities are based on a certain percentage that we collect every year. But then there's also the portions as we go through here, there's 20% set aside for the local streets maintenance for each of your cities and towns. Um, that increases with the sales tax, but that doesn't really explain the complete $13.7 million. So we have the transportation for livable communities, which is $12 million, and that's increasing $9.2 million. So what that is is the, your individual cities have gone out and made the, made the planning to do these certain projects, and the city has now allocated these funds and now planning to contribute to, you, to your programs for these. Um, in the TLC section, we have the Sycamore Valley Park and Ride, which is about $1 million. And there's also about $2 million in there for the Del Norte, um, some transportation issues and connectivity issues around that station as well. Then we also have the pedestrian, bicycle, and trail facilities, which is $6.8 million. And again, in there, there's a $4.6 million increase. And it, there's also the pedestrian piece of that puzzle, which is an increase of $2.4 million. And then we also have the new program, the Gomenum Station, funded by State of California. It's a one-to-one -one match, so as we receive money, we pay out money, and that's going to be about $1.35 million. 
and then the planning department to to follow up on all their congestion management and planning duties for the county as well as us here is about a $65,000 increase. And then we have the debt service. The debt service is pretty much level de debt service. And as we just discussed earlier, that number is going to change and we'll have to come back and adjust the budget to reflect that. Um, but based on the current situation, it looks to be about 16.4 million in principal that's gonna be paid. That's gonna stay the same. The interest amount due is that's something that's gonna change with the reissuance or the changing of the 2012A schedules. Um, and then once again, we're gonna draw down on the, the way the budget is written and budgeted based off the CIP projects. We're gonna utilize the remaining funds of the 2017A bonds of $58 million. So with that, that con concludes my presentation and um, be happy to take any questions or anything. Okay. Um, commissioners, questions, uh, Commissioner Pierce? Yeah, I uh, thank you, Brian. This is a very succinct report, and I appreciate it. Um, given that RM3 passed, and thank you, Contra Costa, for coming in higher than projected. It still didn't get over 50%, but it was about 5% higher in the vote than everybody thought it would be, and that probably contributed a lot. But because of that, um, after the first of next year, when we start collecting money, I would assume we'll need to do a budget adjustment to account for the capital projects and the money we'll be getting through that. Would that be correct? Every year we come back and do a mid-year budget adjustment. Uh, we don't come back in January because capital projects usually are a couple months behind, but we will look at that and see if any additional funding for these projects will come in. Um, and that'll be something that I'll be working with Susan and, and her team and Hisham to go through and ensure what additional funding we can use that might move around some of the other funding, some of the Measure J funding might be allocated right. differently. Um, so I don't we have We have the, some pretty significant projects in that project list, so I'm sure Randy will be anxious to put those to work as soon as we can. Any other commissioners comments or questions? Maybe to add on to that, so we're looking at a readiness plan now of what projects are ready to go. We called the county about Vasco because apparently Vasco was ready to go at 12.9 million, and so we want to make sure that the permits are all up to date so you can advertise January 1 or whenever the commissioners convince staff to write the reg regulations so that maybe they can do some advanced allocations to get better bids because you're going to have a lot of competition here in the near future if SB1 stays in place. Okay. No other Can questions? I, oh, um, uh, Commissioner. Our Smith. executive director's uh, final comment um, prompted my question. SB1, where are, you know, in terms of now and in the future, do we have any estimates in terms of what that p potential impact would be? And I know it's a combination of the authority as well as our local jurisdictions that are receiving, uh, you know, significant dollars. So. Wondering if we have that now, or could it be helpful to have that information too? $2.3 million. <laughs> wow, that was fast. So that, that's the, just the authority, right? Yes, the, so the authority receives out of the local partnership program a $2.3 million okay. per year, and so that's our only uh, risk funds um, in the next fiscal cycle for SB1 funding right. so, for locals. For locals. That's an That's LPP funding, local partnership program funding, formulaic base. Formula base. Yeah. And then it would be helpful if the authority, the little tangentially related to the to budget, could could aggregate that information for all of the cities too and the county, um, because I know that with fifty percent of the funds going to local sources, that might that number I think would be would grow too. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other commissioners' questions? Okay, so at this time, the public hearing is open, and um, I have no speaker cards at this time, but if you would like to speak, then please get me a speaker card. If you do not have one filled out, come to the mic, but the public hearing is now open. Anyone that would like to um, make comments are free to come to the mic. Seeing the big rush ahead of us, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to, to the body. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotter. Trotter.
move approval of the proposed fiscal year 18-19 uh, budget. Thank you. A motion by Trotter, second by Pierce. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Pierce, Hudson, they do a good tag team. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. No abstentions. That passes. Okay, we will move to. Okay, the next item on our agenda today is the item to discuss the program and project management services. Uh, this is an action item that will be presented by Mr. Tim Hale. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Tim Hale, the Deputy Executive Director for Projects. Um, the, we, uh, the authority relies on a program management uh, consultant to assist the authority uh, to deliver our capital improvement program and implementation of projects identified in the expenditure plan. And essentially, this consultant is a extension of our staff and works with us on a daily basis. Uh, Stantec has been providing the services since April of 2015, and the agreement was initially a two-year performance uh, period with two one-year extensions um, at the discretion of the authority. In June 2017, the authority approved the first one-year extension in the amount of $4,416,732. For a new total agreement value of $13,306,732. And this amendment also extended the agreement to termination date of June 30th of 2018. The Stantec team has provided the needed support for expansion of Contra Costa Phi 1 programs, the development of the SAV program, and also to make Momentum Station the hub for testing and innovation. Both the SAV pilot project and Contra Costa Phi 1 strategic plan are expected to be completed by the end of the year. And these tasks require the expertise and key personnel um, by the Stantec team, Stantec team. In addition, the Stantec team has developed excellent historical knowledge of the authority's projects, and some of which are currently under construction, such as SR4 Balfour and I-80 Central Avenue, um, which are also anticipated to be completed in 2018. The team obtained approvals of both the 680 Southbound Express Lanes project and 680 SR4 Phase 3 projects and the 680 Southbound Express Lane project was just advertised, um, and we were planning on breaking ground that project later in summer. The 680 SR4 Phase 3 project is also ready to advertise. We're waiting one last CTC action in June, and we plan to advertise that project in July. The Stantec team has been restructured while retaining key personnel, and the new arrangement will minimize, minimize disruption to all our programs and projects. Due to the restructuring of the team, staff recommends that the construction oversight be performed under a new agreement with Coal Management and Engineering Incorporated for one year. A new agreement will streamline the coordination, communication, and administration of the construction program, and CME has been performing and overseeing the authority's construction program since April of 2015, and the authority is at the peak of the overall construction program and needs CME, CME support to administer uh, 684 and 680 express lanes during the summertime and through the end of this year. In March 2018, the authority board authorized staff to negotiate a one-year extension to the agreement, and staff has completed its negotiation for scope and fee of the amendment to agreement number 435 with Stantec. The negotiated scope and fee for agreement number 435 is $1,396,570 for Contra Costa 501 programs, 1,236,000 for SAV pilot project and $3,182,618 for project program management funds for a total value of $5,815,188 and the 1,236,000 for the SAV pilot project is 100% reimbursable through the $3.5 million grant funds that we received um, mid last year. Staff has also completed negotiations with CME with, for agreement number 498 to perform construction oversight, inspection, and in management for $927,916. This will be the final one-year extension of the agreement with Stantec and CME, and both agreements will terminate in June 30th, 2019. Staff will seek authority board approval in early 2019 to solicit proposals for consultants for PPM services. For the above reasons, staff seeks authorization for the chair to execute Amendment number four to agreement number 435 with Stantec, 
in the amount of $5,815,188 for a new total agreement value of $19,121,920 and execute agreement number 498 with CME in the amount of $927,916 to provide additional PPM services. That concludes my report and ready to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Are there any commissioner questions? Uh, Commissioner Trotter? Oh. And Move I'm approval. Second. Okay, there's a motion by Pierce, second by Taylor. On the question, uh, Commissioner Hudson? Yeah, I, I'm fine with it. I just, I'm looking at this last sentence, staff will seek authority board approval in early 2019. We know they can't go more than, I mean, they can't go, you have, <laughs> As part of this, it almost seemed like, yeah, you're going to go out for another just question when you want to do it. December, <laughs> January, I mean, if that's part of the motion, you don't need to come back to us for this. That's why I read this, you'd come back for it. So usually what we do is develop a scope of work for that particular request for proposal and bring that to the authority board for approval. So the authority of board will approve the scope of that RFP prior to issuing it. All right. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes, no abstention. Okay, next item on our agenda today is the um, Discuss the Authority's three-year salary benefit and compensation plan. This action will be presented by Randy. Good evening, Chair Glover, members of the Authority Board. I'm Randy Carlton, Deputy Executive Director of Administration. Um, the item before you uh, tonight is uh, an administrative item. It's the Authority Staff Compensation Plan for the next three uh, fiscal years, beginning July 1st and ending on June 30th, 2021. Um, we worked with an ad hoc committee of the board um, we call it the Salaries and Benefits Committee, uh, and the committee worked with our HR consultant, uh, Deborah Muchmore, to my right, uh, and they helped prepare a total compensation study and reviewed the results of that study with the committee. Um, we have about 11 slides of information uh, that we'll quickly go through and summarize the, the compensation plan. Uh, I'll turn it over. At, at a point here in a couple of minutes where Deborah will go into a little bit more detail on the total compensation study, the findings and the recommendations that came out of that. Um, a little basic information about the authority, much of which you already know. Um, you know, we're a small shop of 20 employees, all full-time positions. We're currently staffed 19 of those positions and we have one vacancy currently uh, that we're in the process of filling. Um, as established in our administrative code, the board approves the positions, the salary ranges, and all the employee benefits. The board also, by way of the administrative code, uh, delegates all personnel matters to the executive director. And it's within his discretion uh, to place employees at the time when they're hired within that range and to adjust the compensation for those employees during the course of their, their tenure with the authority. Um, here at the authority, um, there are no automatic increases, there are no steps, there are no MOUs, there are no bargaining units. Uh, it's a little different than perhaps what you might find in a, a municipality. And lastly, for some context, uh, when we talk about salaries and benefits as a percent of our total budget, it's approximately 2.1%. The Salaries and Benefit Committee, uh, it was formed by the board you know, to work with staff and our consultants uh, during this process of preparing the compensation plan that you're being asked to consider and approve tonight. Uh, we met with the committee, reviewed those details, and they recommended 
the plan uh, for approval by the board. Uh, a high overview of the compensation plan. Um, to summarize, our compensation philosophy here at the authority is to be competitive in the employment market. We believe this makes us an employer of choice where we can attract and retain the best employees. The compensation plan essentially establishes the positions, the salary ranges, the benefits, and many of the related policies of how those items are administered here. Um, the main benefits uh, you see here listed um, include the pension plan. We have two pension plans, the Classic and the PEPRA. Um, the Classic plan contains um, 16 employees. That's the 2% at 55 plan. The uh, PEPRA plan, which is the post-pension reform uh, plan uh, is the uh, formula there is 2% at 62 and we have three employees in that plan and of the four the last five employees that we've hired have been in PEPA employees. Um, we provide health care benefits consistent with what other public agencies typically provide um, medical, dental, vision, um, and when it comes to vacation leave and sick leave, those things are too are consistent with what we would see in a municipality. And lastly, uh, as a transportation authority, we do offer transportation demand management type incentive uh, that pays a small amount for uh, to encourage and incentivize employees to use BART, ride sharing, and um, um, bicycle riding to work. Okay, now we're going to get into the um, total comp study, which I'll turn over to, uh, to Deborah, and we'll talk about, you know, the study and the, the findings and the, the recommendations. Thank you. Whoops. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Deborah Muchmore. I'm the um, Human Resources Lead for the Greater Bay Area for Regional Government Services, and we were um, we conducted a study for the Transportation Authority um, and uh, for compensation, and we we actually went out and surveyed um, nine of the Bay Area transportation agencies, and we have another slide that'll list those for you. So I'm not going to go over them here, um, but we looked at base salary at the top step. Um, we looked at the paid leave and what that translated to in a monthly value, uh, the pension plans, health care benefits, the cost of those to the authority, and other benefits like short-term disability and things like that. Um, so we studied 11 classifications. Um, most of the things that we found were that most of the positions were competitive within the market at or above the market median. And um, thank you. There's a, this slide gives you kind of a visual of what we found was competitive, uh, what was above, and what was below the market. So basically there were three positions of the 11 that we studied that were significantly below the market median and um, warranted a review of, compensa of the compensation range. So based on the results of the study, we made a few recommendations um, to the authority. The first one was to consider adjusting salary ranges to, to meet where those, um, those, for those three positions that were significantly below the market. Uh, the next recommendation was that we did not actually go out and collect compensation data on all of the positions because the positions in the projects department um, Things had changed in the way in they do project management in their service delivery and in technology over time is significantly enough to warrant looking at the work that they do today to make, ensure that we were matching them against appropriate classifications in the market. So um, we're, we're in the process of reviewing the work that they do in those classifications and we will return to the board in September with that, the results of that study. So there were, excuse me, so there were no comps that you could review that uh, identified a, a similar classification out there of other agencies? To find comps for a position, we have to be confident that the classification and job duties that we're looking at for the position are 
accurately and clearly reflect the duties of that position. And that was where the question came up. It wasn't clear to us after conversations that those that the duties that are written in the job classification clearly and accurately defined all of the positions in the project Thank you. department. Mm -hmm. So recommendation three, we, we recommended to um, that the authority consider changing their short-term disability plan slightly um, and, and basically the waiting period for that plan. The waiting period is currently at 30 days um, and many of the other comps uh, either are on the state disability program, which has a seven-day waiting period, or they have their own short-term disability with a 14-day waiting period. A few of them also had 30, but the majority had 14 or fewer. So we recommended going to a 14-day waiting period. Uh, that helps families that are growing and people that are on short-term disability qualify if they're only going to be off about 30 days. Um, the next recommendation was that employees pay their member pension contribution in full classic members in CalPERS. Um, most of the agencies that we work with throughout the state have moved in that direction, and so we made that recommendation here as well. The comps have moved in that direction in many cases, or they are currently moving in that direction. So the last recommendation is that each, th every three years when the authority goes out for a compensation study, that they use the same um, group of comparable entities if possible. It provides the most apples to apples comparison and for trending purposes across studies, it makes it easier to reflect on what's actually happened. Thank you, Thank Deborah. You. Okay. So in summary, let me just say that there are no new positions uh, being added uh, to the authority. We're keeping the number um, at 20. Uh, the salary ranges uh, in the plan um, are increased uh, by the 12% CPI change of 2.9%, um, and that would be adjusted on January 1st of next year and the following year. Um, by CPI, which would be uh, capped at 3.5%. Um, all employees will be paying the full member contribution rate to the pension, and the authority would no longer be an outlier when we talk about pension, when we compare ourselves to, to other agencies. And we're making a slight change to our uh, short-term disability, um, mainly for uh, newer families and providing that benefit. So with, uh, with that, uh, staff recommends uh, that you approve the compensation plan that we have before you um, and also approve a second resolution which will be provided to CalPERS which will reduce the uh, contribution rate for employees. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that will uh, um, specify that the uh, employees will uh, be paying the 7% member contribution amount. Okay. So, Randy, I know that there's been a working group in place for quite a while um, in working on this, and this is a recommendation that comes from that group that is, that's part of the staff recommendation. Yes, okay. that's correct. just want to make sure that we were inclusive. Uh, Commissioner Pierce? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that this is effective July 1st of 2018. That's correct. Okay. I, I think you misspoke and said oh, January. I'm so sorry. And so it, it, I wanted to make sure that for anybody who's listening to us, this is effective of July 1st of this year. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yes, I'm, I'm a part of that committee, and I just wanted to say that uh, CCTA staff, personally, if I could, I, I really vouch for all of you because uh, you're a wonderful staff. You do one hell of a job for this organization. So anything we can to justify helping you out, per se, um, I think we are very much recommend approval for this. So I move that. Okay. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Abelson. 
All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, let me just thank the, the staff and the committee for this work. We know that it's, uh, it's tough work, very tedious, and we, we thank you for the convening of the committee and getting this done. Thank you. I, I do, if I can, just a point of clarification. The last page, 4.122, where you have the, the references M to what we just voted for, mm -hmm. is that the new one or you're going to increase it on top of that for the monthly salary range? Um, the uh, proposed increase that we saw on the slide earlier yeah. um, is included in okay. this number yeah, for those three positions. Okay. All right, moving on, the next item on the uh, agenda is a new item that uh, needs approval. It's the 11th Amendment of the Employment agreement with Executive Dir Director Randy Arasaki. Uh, this action, this is an action item, and who's going to be presenting this? Randy. Randy. No. <laughs> we'll turn to our council. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't sure who was presenting this. Um, what is before you is an amendment to the Executive Director's agreement. Let me pull that up very quickly. Uh, it is the 11th Amendment. The agreement that is before you would provide for an increase in salary effective July 1, 2018 to $374,269.20. And it also extends the term of the agreement until 2021. Happy to take any questions. Okay. Move, move acceptance. Second. There's a motion by... Commissioner, and I'm, I'm going to get this right. Last name? Haskew. And second by Commissioner Taylor. And on the question. Discussion. Yeah. Quick discussion point. Yeah, I just wanted to make clear for folks in the audience and whatnot that, uh, that, that if you look at the language uh, with respect to the salary item um, on page two of the agreement, and this was the subject of discussion between Randy and me, and Mala worked on it as well. Um, this salary is going to kick in starting July 1, 2018. And it goes on and reads, and this is the key language, and during the term of the agreement. So that's to, intended to memorialize the agreement we've reached with Randy, that there will be no increase in that base during the course of this agreement. And that was something that Randy agreed to, and we uh, in recognition of his amazing service to the authority, put him right at the top of it, this, this particular salary range. Uh, uh, and um, that was the basic trade-off. And with that in mind, I certainly support this motion. Okay. So uh, no other comments. Call for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It passes. Thank you. I'm going to need to recuse myself for this next item. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. I'll be yes. right back. Okay. So while Randy's walking out, our next item is an update on the master corporate agreement with Go Mentum Station. This is an action item and will be presented by Tim Hale. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Again, my name is Tim Hale, the Deputy Executive Director for Projects. And authority staff initiated the CVAV program in late 2014 to foster innovation and research in the field of connected vehicle, connected and autonomous vehicles. So through the CVAV program, the Gomentum Station testbed was formed at the Concord Naval Weapons Station. And in partnership with CCTA, the Gomentum Station Incorporated nonprofit was formed to support the efforts at Gomentum Station. Through this partnership, Gomentum Station has grown into a nationally recognized leader in connected and autonomous vehicle testing. Gomentum Station Incorporated is a non-profit public benefit corporation and is a separate entity from the authority. The authority has no financial interest or authority over Gomentum Station Incorporated. Gomentum Station Incorporated owns the program and testing partnerships 
Gomentum Station is more than just a testing autonomous vehicles at Concord Naval Weapons Station. The testing at Concord Naval Weapons Station only makes up for 20% of the overall program, and the program reaches far beyond the weapons station to advance these technologies, research, and enhance mobility and safety. Gomentum Station Incorporated owns and is responsible for implementation of the program and meeting the needs of the partners, and Gomentum Station Incorporated can deploy their own projects to advance these technologies. They are also responsible for researching and testing at the Conquer Naval Weapons Station. CCTA and Gomentum Station Incorporated have been partners from the beginning and want to explain a little bit about how this partnership works. The U.S. Navy owns the former Concord Naval Weapons Station in the city of Concord. The city of Concord has a master license with the U.S. Navy to schedule and sub-license access to the Concord Naval Weapons Station for the purposes of testing and autonomous vehicles. The authority holds a sub-license with the city of Concord to access the weapons station for autonomous vehicle testing. And in July 2015, the authority, City of Concord, and Concord Local Reuse Authority entered into an MOU to define the roles and responsibilities relative to managing and operating autonomous vehicle testing at the Concord Naval Weapons Station. This MOU is being updated to provide access to the Concord Naval Weapons Station for five years and increase the number of testing partners. The MOU will be brought toward the authority at a future meeting for approval. In November 2016, the authority approved MOU 99.00.01 with Gomentum Station Incorporated to establish the roles and responsibilities to support Gomentum Station Incorporated with the program and testbed operations at the weapon stations. This is how we operate today based on the MOUs. Um, CCTA and Concord support Gomentum Station Incorporated with the program. And so through MOU 99.00.01, the authority staff currently provides support to Gomentum Station Incorporated for managing some of the day-to-day -day operations at the testbed, including scheduling of partner testing, coordination with the City of Concord, and facilitating tours at the weapon station. Authority staff also currently provides support to Gomentum Station Incorporated for marketing, outreach, and media coordination for testing demonstrations, partner announcements, and pilot demonstration projects. Critical to our role, we are responsible for maintaining the sub-license with the City of Concord for access to the weapons station for autonomous vehicle testing, and it is renewed annually. Gomentum Station Incorporated has primarily facilitated and managed the par partnerships at Gomentum Station for testing, research, and CV applications. They are also responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, including maintenance of facilities, scheduling, and tours. And through our MOU with the City, the City of Concord supports the program by providing staff to facilitate scheduling, coordination with the Navy, and monitoring the performance based on the sublicense with the authority. Through our success and partnership, the program has grown exponentially to the point where the framework of the partnership is not meeting the partner needs. The MOU between the authority and Gomentum Station Incorporated is being updated into a master cooperative agreement to better support the program and provide the ability to transfer funds between Gomentum Station Incorporated and the authority. Through the master cooperative agreement, the authority participates in testing demonstration and operations at Concord Naval Weapons Station, including responsibilities for public agency coordination, obtaining agency approvals and permits, design and construction of site enhancements and demonstration projects, facilitating deployment of demonstration projects, and administration of state and federal funding. Gomentum Station Incorporated will be responsible for the management, partnerships, planning and coordination, operations and maintenance, testing, marketing and outreach of the Gomentum Station program, in April 2018, the authority supported AAA's intent to acquire Gomentum Station Incorporated. If the acquisition is completed, the master cooperative agreement would transfer to AAA and would assume the roles of Gomentum Station Incorporated. In the future, the authority may continue to receive federal and state funds for connected autonomous vehicle testing, and Gomentum Station Incorporated may continue to receive private funds from partners. Through the Master Cooperative Agreement, the Authority Gomentum Station will be able to leverage private, federal, and state funds, and based on the grant funding received, the $3.5 million requires a non-state fund match dollar for dollar, and without the private funds, the Authority will not be able to access the $3.5 million. The Master Cooperative Agreement also establishes the framework for allocation of funds, reporting, auditing, and procurements to be consistent with the state and federal funds. Gomentum Station Incorporated will request the funds. The authority will approve and request, and request the, the funds. And subject to the authority approval, 
The request will be submitted to the agency administering the state or federal funds, and once approved, the funds will be transferred to Gomentum Station Incorporated. Through the agreement, quarterly reporting, including supporting documentation based on the type of funds received, will be required and submitted to the authority, and authority staff will perform regular audits of Gomentum Station to make sure in conformance with any regulations associated with the funding. The master cooperative agreement was discussed at the March 2018 board meeting and the authority requested clarifications to the agreement. At its June 7, 2018 meeting, the APC recommended approval of the master cooperative agreement with these revisions, including staff recommended revisions to Section 2, Article 13 for Gomentum Station Incorporated to notify the authority within 60 days of any change in ownership, legal structure, corporate entity status, controlling officers, or board members. Staff seeks direction and approval on the Master Cooperative Agreement number GMS.002 between the authority and Gomentum, and we are ready to take any questions you may have. Okay. Are there any questions, Commissioners? Commissioner Pierce. Thank you, Tim. Um, good job on everybody who's worked on this, and I know particularly uh, Dave Trotter has worked very hard on getting this agreement done, and, and he and Newell worked carefully with, with AAA. Can you tell me the latest update on where the city of Concord is in this process? I got a brief report at TransPAC from a Concord rep, and I just want to make sure I understand what the status of that is now. So City of Concord staff took a recommendation of support for the AAA acquisition of Gomentum Station to a City Council meeting last Tuesday, or the, a week ago Tuesday, and it was supported unanimously. It, it was represented as a sale um, by the City of Concord to Gomentum, and it didn't compute properly, so that's why I wanted. They are approving of the transfer from Yes, okay. That is correct. Okay, Commissioner Trotter followed by Taylor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Tim, uh, I'm looking at this, both your presentation, which talked about us, about the authority maintaining the sub-license. And, and I also would, you've been given to understand that that was important because under this new approach, Gomentum would continue to be able to have access to the Gomentum site the weapon station site pursuant to our sublicense. What I'm not seeing in this 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 revision, this master cooperative agreement, is anything that actually puts that in writing. And I I am concerned about that. I mean, this was a concern three months ago uh, that we wanted to make sure that sublicense was in play, important, institutionalized, and was the basis for. Um, Gomentum Station Inc. to be able to operate out out there under the sublicense. I'm not actually seeing that here, and I wasn't at the APC meeting because I was in Alaska, and if I had been, I'd have brought it up then. So I'm concerned about that. Is the is your question in terms of? Continuing to maintain the sublicense and making sure that's in the agreement. We have a recital to that effect on mm -hmm. Article Three on, in in the recitals. Right, recital three. Um, what I'm not saying that and whether that recital is actually a part of the contractual obligations is debatable. Um, what I'm not seeing is any follow through with respect to you know that's the that is the sublicense under which this cooperative agreement we cooperate. And so I'm wondering uh, whether this is ready without some additional tweaking to be approved. And I don't know whether that might, I mean, maybe for all I know, others may be willing to approve it as it's written, but given that that was something that was drilled into my head when you appointed the subcommittee of Newell and me, and Newell's not here tonight to back me up on this, Newell. No, we, um, we did drill that into you. Um, I'm thinking that this language is, not as complete, not as explicit as you would like to have in such an important legal document. So are we, is this something that we need to make sure that's totally complete and bring back? Or 
I think it's it's possible just to give the, the direction that that, that uh, it's complex enough, in my opinion, it's complex enough that well, unless there is some time constraint that we're operating under and I'm not aware of it, I'd like to, you know, have it be f more uh, thoroughly fleshed out. That's my personal view, but we have a motion in a second, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah. So, could, so could it's I make just a under discussion. Could I make a suggestion for a modification of the motion, and that would be to – um, delegate the final approval of this to the APC at the next meeting pending the insertion of the language that is acceptable to APC to incorporate that particular concern. Can I second that as an amendment? I would not. I, I think we should just bring that back to the full board or either authorize an approval with an amendment to address the concerns that Commissioner Trotter I, I, I raised. Don't, I don't actually like to do minor amendments. Okay, uh, then I would recommend of, we bring it back. Because I, I think in this situation we want to make sure we get it right the first time, not try to get it right on the second try. Yeah, this is, this is not a minor amendment in my opinion. Right. Okay, I'm going to uh, turn to go minimum. Ivan, uh, is there a time restraint on? Ivan's not. Oh. Ivan has nothing to do with it. Okay, uh, Tim, is there some time? Mm -hmm. We we can we can bring this item. Um, um, APC is actually probably going to be canceled in July. Okay, and so bring we'll probably, we can bring this. We can bring, bring this back item to the back board. to full board in July. Okay, but I would also suggest that you maybe run this language. This this minor tweaking of this agreement through the subcommittee mm -hmm. yeah. and we can give you our thoughts and the sooner the better because I have a month-long trial starting July 10th and I'd like to do it this month not in the middle of trial next month. Okay and that subcommittee consists of yourself and Commissioner Arnridge. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Okay that is the direction. Uh, is there any objection to that direction? So we will we will follow the direction as stated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to need to bring Randy back in. He wanna there we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this item before us now is an informational item. It uh So this is the 3B? No. 4.3. No, not 3A. 4.3. Mm -hmm. Oh. Here we go. There it is right there. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is a comes from the planning and it is proposed service uh, details for the Richmond San Francisco service to be provided by the Water Emergency Transportation Authority. This is an informational item that will be presented by Peter Ingram. Uh, good evening, Chair Glover and Commissioners. Uh, this is um, some good news information for you all. Uh, part of our agreement with, with WIDA when we entered into agreement to provide Measure J um, sub-regional West County um, ferry funds to, to fund the service from Richmond to San Francisco was that uh, prior to the service beginning, WIDA staff, WICTAC staff, authority staff, and Richmond staff would get together and work out kind of the final operating details of the service. So we have those tonight. These service details will be going to the um, WIDA board in July. So we wanted to make sure that both WICTAC and the authority got a chance to see these before they went to the board. Um, a lot of good news here. Uh, WIDA staff was able to look at interlining their entire fleet um, of vessels, which allowed us to actually gain an additional um, peak hour trip from Richmond to San Francisco in the morning. So we have we have four peak hour morning trips going to 
San Francisco from Richmond and four peak hour PM trips um, returning to Richmond in the afternoon. While doing so, we also, <clears throat> our WIDA was also to get an a substantial about 25 percent reduction in costs because of their ability to interline these boats and use the crews more efficiently. So that that cost um, reduction has also allowed us to um, initiate the service at a, at a lower fare than was initially thought we were going to have to charge in order to meet the fare box recovery requirements that are associated with um, the services they, they provide. So uh, a lot of good things happening there. Um, marketing plan was complete. There, there's going to be significant outreach done in Richmond on this. We're going to make sure that we have Clipper, um, the Clipper folks there available um, handing out Clipper cards because there's substantial fare reduction for people who use Clipper on the on the ferry service. Um, and uh, Major Butt can can attest to there's the Major Butt, Mayor Butt, the, um, the, fer the the ferry terminal is is well under construction. The parking lot's under construction. The the pier is um, under construction. The the piles are in place. So once the pier is complete the float will be added and the, the uh, passenger shelter area, there's, there's renditions of the passenger shelter in your um, staff report, so you can take a look at that. It, it looks real nice. So um, one thing that we're going to, you know, one, another thing that the cost reduction is going to do, it's going to allow us to, um, to keep our commitment of 10-year operating funds um, with using much less of the Measure J funds. Now with the passage of R RM3 and funding going to WIDA for RM3, we'll be able to look at how we can access those funds for this service. So a lot of, a lot of good things happening. We will come back to you probably in September with a funding resolution to put in place um, what we need to be able to start paying those invoices as they start coming in on the operation. That's great. great. Uh, commissioners? Uh, I, I will add that uh, opening day is set for October 31st, and those those of you who show up in costume dressed as Rosie the River will ride free. Any? So this was the informational item. Is there any up? Just, uh, just one quick Carter? question. One quick question for Mayor Bud, and that is, I want to know how much CCTA money was spent on those really attractive photo simulations that were in our packet. They're beautiful. I, I, I don't know. I think we did those. Uh, they're, they're, it, it looks like it's going to, it looks like, you know, 21st century dating, but looking back at like Art Deco, it's very interesting <laughs> architecturally. Very cool. Yeah, very nice. Great. Any other comments or questions? Peter, thank you for the presentation. Good news always goes far. Okay, moving on. The um, so you have correspondence, which is next, and that's uh, there's some additional letters in your handouts uh, package. Is there any questions from commissioners or comments on any of that? Seeing none, we'll move to the next item, which is the associate committee report. Are also attached, and there's uh, located in your handout package. Does the commissioner? Have any comments, questions on those? Next is uh, chair's report. Um, no chair's report. Commissioner's comments? Commissioner Pierce? Yeah, just one item. I wanted to report that I attended on uh, our behalf the CALCOG meeting, the California Council of uh, Association of Councils of Government. Uh, we had a board meeting. I am your rep. Um, and we met in Sacramento going over a heavy list of um, legislation and other things going on. And I have to say that our executive director there, Bill Higgins, is one of the most brilliant minds in legislative stuff. And he's really looking out for us, trying to make sure that we get the best deal we possibly can. So uh, it was a lively meeting, but uh, lots of good things accomplished. Okay, uh, Commissioner uh, Hudson. Yes, I'll, I think I'm giving this one for uh, Mayor Taylor also. Uh, very interesting meeting back in Washington, D.C. about, uh, gosh, only a week and a half ago. 
Um, I have to say that uh, our lobbyist, Jason, did a great job setting up meetings for us, stay on target, go, 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 and and uh, talk to a lot of people. I, I, I want to highlight some things, but the one that has to come to mind is I got to see uh, Bob Taylor in action uh, when this lady said that she was going to Vermont for the best corn that she's ever – Bob jumped right up there and – and I thought the meeting was going so-so till then. Now I, now I know what uh, graph truly means because make sure you send her corn. Um, also went in to see, uh, um, uh, I just say somebody's name I can never pronounce, doctor, whomever, whatever position, Randy can tell me. Uh, but, uh, and my little buddy Vincent Valdez was there. There is a message from that meeting. We are no longer no moss, Tim. We are mobility on demand. They don't like that European name. They dump that thing. Um, then went to uh, what I considered the most interesting meeting. Uh, I just know them as the cough drops. The Smith Brothers at Department of Energy uh, and Linda Bingston. Is that her last name? Uh, huh? Bruce Dean. Very, uh, these people are really engaged. They want to be part of this. And they, they did all but tell where in the website you could find the grants for whatever. We came out of there, I thought, very impressive. Uh, uh, I went back to the Air District the day after when we got back. I uh, was talking to Damian Bream. He knew her. I said, you need to invite these people out here for the summit, whether or not they'll come because of uh, all the wonderful points we've made with uh, California and Washington, D.C. is another story. But uh, Department of Energy is part of this now. They're not, uh, they're not sitting by the side watching. They're, they're involved. Um, the uh, last thing, uh, or one of the last things I want to add is, uh, I'm going to try and do this delicately. I heard one of the greatest lines that I've ever heard back in Washington, D.C. by one of the Mater D's <clears throat> in the Washington, D.C. area. I will leave it alone. But after thinking about it, it truly is a compliment to the chum line that we have got out in Washington, D.C. And I hope we never lose it because people know who we are back there. And it's like every time you see somebody coming out of meetings, uh, walking into a restaurant, uh, uh, we've got pretty good, pretty good status going back there. And I, I, I would actually suggest that we send Randy out more. Yeah, just get rid of him. Send him out there as much as you can. Uh, but it's working. There is truly value for that, though he doesn't live there. Um, I, I, I would leave it with that, Ed, that um, um, July 13th, Jason's going to be out here, our lobbyist, and I think I got him the appointment he asked for at the Air District. Uh, I believe he's working with the Port of Oakland, but this is, this is a classic example of, of, uh, of the team is growing not only in size but in influence. Great. Uh, Commissioner Romit? Followed by yeah. butt. In, in, in Vision, East County happened uh, a week and a half ago on a Friday out at the Byron Airport. It really is out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there were about 30 attendees who showed up, and some of them were there was their, their first time ever out there. They really couldn't believe it, how desolate and how um, where they were at was, where it was located at. Uh, it was an opportunity uh, for CTTA staff to update all the all the attendees on the status of the uh, 239 and the airport connectors. We had representatives from the county's uh, airport and um, economic development staff there to give, give uh, updates on what was going on that way at the airport and plans for the airport, what's in the future. Um, and, and looking at an economic uh, um, drive for East County, and we had a final presentation by the city managers of the four cities out there. Uh, well, like I say, there was about 30 people in attendance. It lasted for almost two, two and a half hours, and I think everyone left um, with a better understanding of the importance of the airport and what impact it can have on all of these Contra Costa. Thank you. I think you also had a presentation on the northern waterfront. Mm -hmm. We had um, yeah, when Northern Water Farm was represented, EC Squared was represented. Yes, yeah. we had okay. all of us there. I, yes, I just wanted to make sure we. <laughs> okay, uh, Commissioner Butt. 
Um, I was at the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Boston last week, and uh, these are great meetings. Um, and one of the one of the uh, themes was infrastructure, and of course, a big part of that was transportation. So it was nice to be there. But one interesting thing, I think, next to mayors, I think the most people there were people who worked for Stantec. I swear, every time I sat down at a table and we were introducing ourselves, it was like Stantec, 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 Mayor Stantec, Stantec, and me. And um, so they uh, they're, they're, they were well represented. And I, it, what was interesting is I, when I introduced myself and talked to them, you know, I told them that as CCTA we do a lot of business with Stantec and most of them didn't have a clue, you know, where's, where's, where's Contra Costa County? Where's that, you know, so. <laughs> maybe, maybe they don't talk to each other from, you know, but. <clears throat> okay. Ex officio members. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we did open BART to Antioch at the end of May, and several commissioners uh, were able to make it. Um, and I want to appreciate the uh, uh, contributions that CCTA has made and MTC to making that a successful project. So uh, we are suffering from more success than we anticipated. The EIR estimated forecasted about 5,600 trips a day, and uh, I just got the daily report where it's 7140 which is in the EIR several years out. So we're way ahead of, uh, of, of forecasts. I'm, I'm sure Council Member Wilson, as I have heard uh, plenty of complaints about the uh, not enough parking, uh, we are looking actively to try to respond to that. We've had several mat matters that uh, need to be addressed. I think we've been reasonably successful in, in taking care of some safety issues and circulation issues. But parking remains a challenge. But we are uh, looking at a number of different alternatives, and hopefully next month or the next or the next couple of months we'll be able to talk about that publicly. But I think we all understand more parking is needed out there. But again, all those that you attended, it was a great day. We had well over 700 people in attendance, which was a larger uh, turnout than we anticipated. Um, and the the support of the system itself has been terrific. People really. Uh, really find the ride uh, exceptional and we just have to solve one more problem and we're at it. We'll, we'll, we'll try to find some solution, at least on an interim basis, that will provide additional access for people out there. Again, thanks to CCTA for the funding. And, and, and congratulations to, to you. Um, you've done an outstanding job. This was a vision that uh, you had and it's come through fruition. So. It's wonderful, and this is a good problem to have. So let's figure out how to find the parking. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other commissioners? Okay. Executive Director. Commissioners, I just have a, a couple of things to say. One, we opened bids on the Interstate 680 HOV lane southbound, and it's an uh, express lane conversion. The engineer's estimate is $70 million. So how you calculate that is look for like projects and then based on quantities try to ascertain what the bid's going to be. And so we opened bids, six bidders, uh, 64200000 plus or minus was a low bid. 64230000 plus or minus was a second low bid. So about 30% or $30,000 $30, apart, about eight to eight, a little over 8% under the engineer's estimate, which is, is a great number. And then the lowest bidder ended up meeting a 16% DBE goal, this disadvantaged business enterprise. And so we're excited about that bid. It, it, it kind of illustrates the fact that, you know, we're known as a partnering agency, and I think we're an owner of choice. And so what we try to do is we try to make sure that, that we work hard and diligently with our partners. That's the contractor. It's okay that the contractor makes money and no – uh, Commissioner uh, Taylor didn't like uh, change orders until we change ordered that second bridge in at Sand Creek. Yeah. But we, we, <laughs> then now he loves change orders. But we, we ended up getting the partner project of the year for State Route 4 Hillcrest 3B. And so we were honored. And we, we participated on a, a C-suite panel talking about how partnering works at our agency. And they brought up over and over, we can't pay as fast as CCTA. And so that's the airport the Mineta Airport in San Jose, they can't pay five days or less. 
I would cut a check personally for five days or less because it gets us better bids. And the reason why is our subs get paid faster. And it may not be the prime that needs the money, but for sure those subcontractors need to get paid uh, very quickly. We've brought, brought the recruiting effort inside. We're using governmentjobs.com. We're using a tool there, NeoGov, I believe, Terry Ann, NeoGov. We got 222 applications for our admin assistant. So that although you know the unemployment rate is very low, for some reason people want to work here for all of you. And so that's 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 great news as far as I'm concerned. I did take a call today talking about a private sector initiative looking at uh, low draft 40 passenger ferry service between Antioch and Martinez. And so we're going to take a look at that in, in more depth. They want about $224,000 for a six month pilot project. So maybe we can How much find was that again? $224,000 for a six month pilot. That's their piece. They want to charge $25 per round trip. Per round trip? $25 per round trip between Antioch and, and Martinez. Oh, Antioch and Martinez. Antioch and Martinez. Okay, not to the city. Where? Not to San Francisco. No, 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 no. Okay. This is to start the this, but that would take a lot of people off and then get them onto off the freeway. So anyway, I think what else do I have here to announce before I? Oh, Marta Antioch. I, I did. We did speak in that. We went to. I went to Australia. I, I spoke at the International Road Federation, Roads Australia. Roads Australia is a compilation of the private sector and public sector, and it's a great opportunity to make sure that you can talk intelligently and legally between the private sector and public sector without violating any RFP. It's a great group. Talked about the innovation program here. Their Minister of Infrastructure and Smart Cities for the country of Australia flew out and he met with us in our office and then we took him out to go Mentum Station. They're trying to do some of the things that we do. They're a population of 24 million people in, in an area that's the size of, of uh, the United States, but they have high congestion problems. So they're trying to borrow some of our ideas. We, we like that meeting. Um, Prospect Silicon Valley is now heading up an initiative to try to bring together thought leaders on the autonomous vehicle and how it's going to impact the Bay Area. And so that, that, that project has started. We were invited to that. And then you heard about the federal engagement program. I do not live in, in Washington, D.C. That's the great news. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Commissioner okay. Taylor. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, would, would you tell them how much you and Lindsay protected the mayor? We, we had to protect the mayor quite quite a bit, yes. No, no. The, when we were in the, the the SUV. Oh yeah. So we so we were th these things you run, and the mayor thought we were doing this on purpose. But we have one meeting in Rayburn, one meeting to the other side of the Capitol. We have to come back, go back, come back, and then we were at the Department of Energy, which is w in, way off site, and then we were coming around the corner trying to go to, to visit. Senator Harris's staff back in the Capitol, but there was a shooting, and so the whole place was jammed, and we were in this in the in an Uber, and so we all said forget this, and so we all got out and we said that's the end of the ride, and we went to Metro and took off the other direction. So we we had to we we were his protection. We were shielding him from any potential um, hazard hazards. Is that correct, Mayor? Said. I got to be honest with you. I never seen so many cops, police dogs, fire engines. Right, Lindsay? It was utter chaos. So we found out it was a shooting. So I just followed Lindsay and Randy wherever they told it. They had it together, though. It was a great. It was a great trip. Thank you. I did. If I could add one other thing, federal. Mm -hmm. I have now had the distinction of going through three of these parades. I don't know what you think you had here with. Golden State winning, but it was nothing compared to what the Washington Capitals were doing. When I got out to the airport early that day, they people in red were lined up for where you would buy a card to get on the metro, on the new Silver Line, up over the freeway and almost back down to the bus that let you off there at Dulles. You can almost get into Dulles now with the Silver Line train. I had never, the only thing that compared to it, I mean, I was at the 2010 Giants when they won. That was pretty nutty. But the Stanley Cup in Chicago was about as crazy as it gets to. But Washington may have matched it. 
it was the perfect time to get out of town, then or the day before the inauguration. Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, we stand adjourned. Good job.